Welcome on in Cougar Tracks podcast powered by kslsports.com. I'm your BYU insider, Mitch Harper. Happy as always to have you on board of the podcast wherever you may be listening or watching as the podcast is streamed live at high noon every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the KSL Sports YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook page. It's been a lot of fun doing these streams every other day for you, and I think that it's only going to continue to grow as we get closer and closer to the football season. 113 days from today, BYU will be taking on South Florida. So 16 weeks till kickoff from tomorrow. The Cougars and the Bulls are going to be lining it up in the new sombrero, and we cannot wait for that. I know me, I'm I'm pumped for this football season to cover everything. It's going to be a lot of fun. Cannot wait for all of that. So here's what we've got on deck for today's edition of the podcast. BYU and Utah State, the football series is put on hold. With BYU going to the Big 12 Conference, the battle for the old wagon wheel is taking a little bit of a pause. I'll share my thoughts on that. What does it mean also for the future of the BYU versus Utah rivalry? Could that take a pause as well? BYU locked in some key official visitors coming up and a recap of the BYU Fan Fest and some commentary from head coach Kalani Sitake, who I caught up with at the Fan Fest. But we'll start things off with BYU and Utah State as the Cougars and the Aggies will not be playing after the 2022 season, at least for the foreseeable future. The games in 2023, 2024, 2025, and 2026, they've all been canceled. They're gone. And it's no surprise because with BYU's move to the Big 12 Conference and the Big 12 likely going to a nine-game conference schedule, it's tough to squeeze in Utah State, and those games go by the wayside. As you saw in the press releases from Tom Homo, the BYU Athletic Director, and Utah State AD John Hartwell, there's a good working relationship between BYU and Utah State. I don't look at this move as BYU trying to big-time Utah State. BYU's always been bigger than Utah State, so it wasn't like, hey, this is the chance now to big-time the Aggies. It just didn't work out. It just didn't work out. This is not equal to when Utah put a pause to BYU versus Utah. BYU versus Utah is considered one of the great rivalries in college football. No one is going to mistake BYU and Utah State as one of the great rivalries in college football. BYU and Utah State since 2010 has been a entertaining, fun matchup that's been consistently pretty dang good. And it's gone a little bit back and forth with the Aggies winning four games and BYU still having the upper hand each and every year. But it's been somewhat back and forth. There's been a lot of competitive football games. But it's not being mistaken as one of the great rivalries in college football. If you're going to have a priority list, if you're Tom Homo, as far as the rivalry structure, Utah is going to be number one. You know, Utah State, I think also, too, that what's challenging for Tom Homo navigating all of this with unloading these 10, 11, 12-game independent schedules is picking which ones you want to keep. There's so many good games that BYU has lined up between 2023 and 2030 that you hate to let go of traditions. BYU and Utah State has been played since 1922. It's been played 90 times. But at the same time, you probably like if you're Tom Homo, I want to see BYU play Miami. I want to see BYU maybe play Virginia Tech. BYU is going to play Arkansas. They're going to play Tennessee. And honestly, my argument to all of that is that when you see the reports coming out that Greg Sankey and the SEC, the Southeastern Conference, them being okay 
with staying at four teams in the playoff, that to me is concerning for the Big 12. It's concerning for the Pac-12 too, but I think especially for the Big 12 because as we know, they're going to fight a perception battle. The college football media will look to knock them down and say that they are not a good league because they don't have a blue blood brand when Texas and Oklahoma leave. So if the playoff stays at four, to me, non-conference scheduling, if you're only at three conf- or non-conference games, and don't know yet, but it seems like this was an unintentional way of announcing by BYU that the Big 12 is headed towards nine conference game. That's been kind of the expectation all along. Those three non-conference slots are critical. And it might be a situation where you have to play two P5s and an FCS. Maybe. So BYU and Utah State goes by the wayside. The SEC, though, like I said, they're okay with standing at four, four teams in the playoff. Non-conference scheduling would get a lot trickier, and you'd have to probably be a little bit more aggressive as a Big 12 member to try and put yourself in a position to be in the playoff. Playoff is a distant thought right now, I think, for Cougar fans. They just want to compete and try to win a Big 12 title. But if that special season happens and you go 11-1 and or 12-1 and as a Big 12 champion, you want to be rewarded with a playoff spot. If it was a 12-team playoff, no one's breaking a sweat. BYU would be in. The Big 12 champ would always be in. But if it's 14 playoff, it's concerning. And that's where, again, non-conference scheduling, it's kind of tricky right now. What becomes the priority? But Utah State, not a priority right now. And I think going forward, if the, if the Aggies do appear on the schedule, you probably go two for one, maybe three for one. That's what it was back in the day with Lavelle. You know, Utah State, it's just that program has risen quite a bit since the 80s and 90s. It has. Their facilities are really good. Uh, the stadium is not the greatest, but the press box is nice. The weight room is nice. The football complex is nice. Utah State has grown quite a bit. But not many P5 programs go to stadiums on road games that hold less than 30,000 fans. They just don't. That That's just not standard operating procedure at the Power 5 level. Sadly, that's... And I always bring this up, but it's true. Perception matters more in college football than sometimes results. If you go on a road game to a venue that has less than 30,000 seats, perception-wise, people go, what are you doing? You're P5. What's wrong with you? It's just, I don't think, again, it's a big-time move by BYU. They're not trying to big-time the Aggies. I think it's just... Got a lot of other games. And you also got the, the element of Utah, too. What does BYU do with Utah? That, to me, is going to be fascinating. What the Cougars do with the Utes. Because, to me, I feel like if, if Utah had committed to BYU throughout BYU's time as an independent program and said, Let's play every year without interruption. This is not even a debate. BYU would continue the rivalry with Utah, no questions asked, and there wouldn't even be this conversation. But when Utah played Michigan, when Utah opted to play Florida, pauses in this memorable and historic rivalry have happened. Like BYU was willing to rope off one of the first three weeks of their independent schedules every year for the Utes. Every year. And that's coveted inventory weeks because, as we've seen, BYU can pretty much get anyone in college football in those first three weeks as an independent when it comes to the schedule. You know, I could go through the list of programs they've played. They're pretty much P5. So those are the spots where you get the P5 brands. But BYU was willing to say, Utah, you're sliding in because Utah didn't want to play it in November. Rightfully so. I get that. They saw... We all saw what a November game looked like when Utah's in the Pac-12 and BYU's a non-conference foe for the Utes. It, it just didn't have much buildup. BYU was 6-5. and five. Utah was already clinched the Pac-12 South. There just wasn't much juice to it. 
But BYU was willing to rope off a special week every year on the schedule for the Utes. And there was interruptions, though. Two different ADs. There's been interruptions. I feel like, again, similar to Utah State, better working relationship with Mark Harlan than, say, Dr. Chris Hill, who I think wanted to move away from the BYU series completely. But because there's been pauses, I think BYU has to look at and go, you got to do what's best for BYU. And I will say, if you did, in a hypothetical scenario, remove the Utes, things get a little bit easier to forecast the non-conference schedules. So 2023, you've got Tennessee at Arkansas, Southern Utah. Let's assume they probably have four Big 12 home games and five on the road. So you probably got a situation where you're looking at six home games and six on the road. Pretty standard. It's a good non-conference schedule. It's a great schedule. 11 Power 5 opponents. That's a fun schedule. 2024, where Utah reemerges on the slate, what do you do? You've got Nevada. That was a game that was scheduled well before BYU was invited to the Big 12 Conference. August 31st date at Utah, at Wyoming, Utah Tech, East Carolina, at NC State. Let's assume maybe five Big 12 home games. What do you do? If you hypothetically removed Utah, I think you'd probably go Nevada at Wyoming and Utah Tech. Then you're looking at seven home games on the schedule. Say what you will about playoff opportunities, things like that, but an additional home game for revenue, that's pretty nice. Revenue is a big thing. Trying to keep up with the Joneses. You're not going to get a full share of Big 12 money. Seven home games would be nice. 2025, you've got only Stanford and Utah on the schedule now that Utah State's gone. Utah would be a home game. Stanford would be a home game. Probably an FCS game. 2026 at Miami, at Utah, USF, Arizona, at Stanford, at Troy, at Virginia Tech. Probably five Big 12 home games. I think you want to keep at Miami. It's it's a tough call to make because despite like games like Miami, games against Tennessee, Arkansas, there's no signage around BYU Student Athlete Center that says beat Tennessee. There's no signage that says beat Arkansas, beat Miami. Says he beat Utah. And it's undeniable the history, the pageantry behind BYU and Utah. And it's always a game that lives up to its billing. It always lives up to the rev- the, the ticket cost. It just, it lives up to it. It always delivers. It's an incredible game. But is there much of an appetite for the two programs to keep playing? I don't know. I think it's it's a very tricky spot because Utah's going to be ramping up their non-conference schedules too. They got LSU in the future schedules. They got Baylor already. What happens? Like that's a component that is not getting talked about much on Utah's side is that they have ramped up things on their non-conference schedules with Harlan. LSU, Wisconsin, Baylor, and Kyle Whittingham, as long as he's been the head coach, they kind of done this kind of ABC type of model kind of stems back from Dr. Chris Hill, A game, B game, C game, C game, typically an FCS opponent. BYU was always viewed in their thought, and it's as rightfully so as an A game. Do you want to play in the same non-conference LSU and BYU? To me, if you're Utah, you should want to because you're fighting, like the Big 12, a perception battle in the Pac-12 conference. Utah does not have the same cachet as USC. And 11 and 1 or 12 and 1 Utah, it's not a foregone conclusion that they would be in the playoff. The same would be said for BYU. So you need extra data points, in my opinion, from a strong strength of schedule standpoint, non conference especially, to give no reason for the playoff committee to knock you for a Ohio State, for a Clemson, for an LSU, for an Alabama. But I also understand the argument of that is a grind 
for your athletes to play 11 P5 teams in a schedule. It's tough. It, it's a tricky thing. That's why, to me, I would love to see these conferences as divisions start to probably become a thing of the past, go to eight conference games and have four non-conference games. And I don't think we're having any debates about this. What do you do with Utah? What do you do with Utah State? You can kind of make it all work. But when you only have three non-conference games and with your with BYU not adding any new inventory between now and 2030, if you're Tom Homo, you're reshuffling the deck and there's some games that are like, man, I worked a lot of years to get that and I want that game. I don't blame him. That that Miami home and home is one where it's like, you don't touch that. That to me is like BYU, Tennessee. The opportunity, to, sometimes you just like, that's once in a lifetime stuff. You can't pass that up. And BYU and Miami has so much history. You can't pass that up. It makes it tricky. Because also, you're if you're Kalani Sataki, you're like, man, well, I need more resources. You're going to give me a schedule that has 11 power five teams? Give me more resources then, because that is a gauntlet. I wish there was uniformity in schedules in college football. That would make everything easier. If, if we knew that everyone in college football was willing to go out and test themselves in the non-conference, see, the thing is, is that the Bamas, they've catered the system to where it's like, go do your neutral site game. I know they're going to play some more home and homes with some power programs in the future. Texas coming up this fall. But typically, Bama goes week one in a neutral site, and then they're off the grid till about November. And everyone's trying to follow that model. And because Alabama, they, they're cooking in an FCS game. They're cooking in some New Mexico State. There's two or three games on Bama's schedule every year where they could trot out the walk-ons and they're winning by 30. And they're still getting the playoff, no questions asked, because they passed the eye test. That is the problem with this system. So when you see Bama's of the world having the level of success they're having, you're going, well, why don't we just do that? But the problem is you're not Bama. You're not the per you don't have the perception. It, it's a pain in the neck because I think everyone, me personally, I've gotten to the point where it's just like, you know what? Let's call it what it is. Power five schedules and maybe a few high level G5 teams like the Boise's of the world. That's about it. Just schedule all, all each other and that's, let's call it a day. No more of this FCS game. I, I get it from the, the ecosystem of football. you got to have the money flowing through, and it just makes everything work. I get that argument from the Jimbo Fishers, from the Kalanis of the world. But to me, it's like, do you want to watch that game? Do you really want to watch BYU Southern Utah? I don't. I, I mean, I will because I like seeing like the freshmen, the deep walk-on guys getting a chance to get some run. But when a push comes to shove, I'd rather see BYU Virginia Tech. I'd rather see BYU Utah than BYU versus Southern Utah. But when you're limited on options and you're trying to keep your team healthy, you're trying to contend for a chance in the playoff and have the best record possible and livelihoods are on the line, it's tough. It is a tough deal to, to ask. I, I think the Utah game will stay. I don't think it's going to be every year, though. I don't. I, I could see where maybe 2024 and 2025 it happens. And maybe there's another pause. Because Utah's got some big non-conference games as well. So. A lot to unpack for Tom Homo, that's for sure. That's probably been priority number one for him. In fact, it has been. Unloading all of these schedules and trimming it down and getting it locked in to where it's pretty much three or four non-conference games. Speaking of trimming down, some recruits are trimming down their official visits coming up, some big-time recruits. Walker Lyons, four-star recruit, and Hunter Clegg, an outside-edge prospect, four-star recruit as well. They locked in their official visits to BYU. They're going to be visiting Provo coming up on June 3rd through the 5th. Huge weekend for BYU. I mean, you talk about blue-chip recruits, that's them. 
those are foundational pieces for the Big 12 era. Those those are, I, I bring up perception a lot. Those are perception shifters. You get those type of recruits to commit, that signals, hey, BYU is ready to play. BYU is ready to contend in the Big 12. It, it's not just one guy does not determine success in a Power 5 league, but it would say to the Big 12 peers, BYU is ready to compete at a higher level on the recruiting trail. And I will say, too, BYU spring evaluation period offers have been a lot more strategic. A lot of guys that are already loading up on offers, it's not just BYU the first FBS offer. Some of the guys that they're offering are maybe some 2024 guys, 2025, but they're also offering a lot of four-star recruits. BYU's doing some star chasing. Being in the Bay 12 has opened some new doors for BYU, and I think that's a good thing for the Cougars. Also, the edits, the graphics that BYU is putting together, pretty impressive. I, I think that there it is noteworthy. The There was a posting, now hiring posting, for a football social media creative director. That position was filled by Tyler Bullock, and he's doing a nice job with these edits. You saw the official visit videos. Uh, Emmanuel Waller posted, thanks for showing the love, BYU. He's a BYU commit. They're posting some good stuff, sharing this stuff to these guys. I think when you've got the component of BYU photo, you've got the technology that BYU has, they're they're putting out some good stuff. And then you got someone dedicated solely to football edits. That matters. That is a, th a big thing in today's world of college football. I think another big thing in, in the world of college football, it, despite all the money that's being thrown into these programs, people that are investing a lot of that money is the fans. And BYU held a fan fest earlier in the week on Wednesday night up in Farmington. Met a few of you, appreciate those of you that said hi and, and said, appreciate what you do. It was, it was a pleasure talking to some of you. Always enjoy my, my conversations with fans. But it was a fun event. Uh, a little bit chilly. The weather was a little bit cooler. So I think that maybe that took away the, the massive crowds, legion of people. And it was also a, a random Wednesday night in May. So a little bit lower profile, but a lot of fun. I know my kids had a great time at the event. But I caught up with Kalani Satake, and I asked him about the role that the fans play in BYU football because Kalani, he talks a lot about BYU football being a family. So what role does BYU football fans, do they play in the BYU football family? This was Kalani Satake. You've heard me say this before, Mitch, that what makes BYU special are the people. The people are the fans and Cougar Nation. I mean, that's that's they've been big time for so long. That's why I'm so happy about the Big 12 invite because it, it kind of confirms what we all knew anyways. And so I grew up a BYU fan, you know, so then many of our, our players uh, grew up BYU fans as well. So being able to connect with fans and see them and being available to them, it's, it's the access to our players and our team. It's important that we uh, provide these moments, these fan fests and opportunities to, to see them even after games or during practice and stuff like that, that we can, whatever we can do at events, we can do to bring the fans together with our team. Alumni day, we did that, you know, on, on the, uh, the, the alumni game. I just want Jack to go crazy and Dave Almodova and those guys just to find more opportunities for our players to be around them. And that's, that's what this whole thing's all about. Good stuff there from Kalani Satake about the importance of the fans. And it was a fun event. I, I think that, you know, I was talking with Kalani after that and, he was even saying how he would have loved those sort of events as a kid to go see Mappellini and, and things like that. I even told him, I said, I, I remember the old watermelon bust and him and Satemanali Jr. addressed the Cougar Stadium crowd, the Cougar Club. I was there at that with my dad in 2000. And, you know, those were those were memorable events. Those create fans. And I think it was a bit stunning. He's like, you remember that? And I'm like, hey, Kalani, you got a photographic memory. I, I got a little bit of one, too. Not as good as you, but uh, still pretty good memory. Weird stuff that I remember in my life. 
But again, it was a good time at the Fan Fest. Next Saturday, there'll be another Fan Fest down in St. George uh, from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. So after you're done with the Fan Fest, fire it up on Cougar Sports Saturday on KSL News Radio down in St. George, and you can listen to Legacy Home of the Cougars and hear me and Matt Biamonte talk all things BYU sports. Speaking of which, coming up tomorrow, we'll be on the air live from noon to 3 BYU offensive lineman Kingsley Suamataia will join the show and BYU fullback Mason Wake. So a little bit of a summer check-in with those guys as they get ready for some big years ahead for them, which I think uh, they're going to be key pieces to what BYU does offensively in the 2022 season. But that's going to do it for me on this edition of the Cougar Tracks podcast. You can subscribe to the show on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Leave a rating and a review. It helps out the show a ton. You can also download the KSL Sports app if you miss any of the shows to listen on demand. But we'll be back on Monday. Check me out on Cougar Sports Saturday on 102.7 FM and 1160 AM from noon to 3 on Saturday. But I'll talk to you on Monday here on Cougar Tracks at high noon. It's always powered by kslsports.com.